for, don't forget, quiz one is going to close tomorrow at 8 in the morning, 8 in the morning. So you've got all of today to log in there. So like six, six of 65 people have done so, so far. Um, so that's good. Um, let's see. You've got homework one is due. I hadn't looked at it at all, but the homework one was due. Uh, homework two is due tonight. So uh, make sure you don't forget about those. Today, we're going to move into more back to statics. So we did a little bit of mechanics and materials for a while with the axial stress and the strain. Now, today is going to be pretty much mostly statics to topics again. Um, one of them that you looked at in 122, so the idea of moments and you know torques, but I think you always call them moments. Uh, and then another one that's an application of that, assuming we get to it. So let's start with the idea of moments. Oh, wow, it's really, really quite thick there. That's better. Moments, torques. Um, we're going to use torques for a very specific thing later on uh, at the end of the quarter. Uh, so what we're going to talk about right now, really, are we're going to define as moments. Um, but first, let's talk about this idea of when we had concurrent force systems. because That's what we've been dealing with. Remember, in a concurrent force system, no matter how many forces you had, their lines of actions all intersected at one point. And we ended up with these three equilibrium equations that we could use. And these three equations told us that as long as these were true, that the forces components in X, the force components in Y, and the force components in Z all added to zero, that uh, we were in static equilibrium as far as uh, translation. So moving left and right and up and down and forward and backwards. Uh, we were in that kind of static equilibrium. Um, but sometimes we have non-concurrent force systems. Actually, probably most of the time we have non-concurrent force systems. So this would be a system where uh, these three equations X, Y, and Z are still true because if it's static equilibrium, if whatever the object is is not translating, you know, moving left and right or up and down or forwards and backwards, then those three still need to be true, but um, none of those three X, Y, and Z equations prevent the thing from rotating about some point. So non-concurrent force systems need some kind of equation to make things not rotate. So here's a non-concurrent force system, a very simple one that you've probably worked with in 122. I'm going to use this little symbol right now to show that that end has a pin on it, meaning that there's something that looks like, you know, I don't know, some kind of bracket, and there's a round pin in that little deal. And what this pin does is it keeps whatever is connected to it, so keeps this piece from moving uh, left and right, so it can't go this. Wow, that's really big too. Can't go this way or this way because there's a pin right here, and the part can't go up or down because there's a pin right there. Uh, so pins actually constrain an object in two directions, um, left and right, up and down, or X direction and Y direction a lot of times. And it doesn't have to be left and right, up and down, just these two directions, the way we're going to represent them, they're going to be orthogonal to one another. So it doesn't actually matter if they're horizontal or vertical, as long as they're 90 degrees from each other uh, in our coordinate system. So that's what pins do. And then we also talked about in 122, the idea of a roller. So that's the idea of maybe there's something at the other end of this beam that's attached to it. That's kind of like on skates or something. You know, there's little, maybe it's connected by a pin or whatever, but there's little roller elements that uh, let it move in one direction. So this roller 
can move in the x direction, the horizontal direction, but it constrains movement in this direction. We'll say that it also constrains movement in both of these directions, um, although you could probably lift the roller off the ground uh, if it was really a set of wheels or whatever. But the idea of the roller is that there's some way for the part to move in one direction and not in the other direction. So there's only one reaction there, whereas on the pin there's two reactions, one for X and one for Y. Um, a lot of, lot of our pieces that we're going to deal with are going to be set up where there's these two fixtures, a pin and a roller. Um, and that may seem odd because, you know, do you really, like if you're bolting something together, do you really put a bolt on one end and the other end it has some kind of rolling thing to it? That may or may not be true, but a lot of larger scale things and even small scale things, um, they do account for what's being accounted for here. And one of the things that's being accounted for is um, temperature expansion. So a lot of our pieces that we're going to design are metal. And as they heat up, they get longer. As they get colder, then they contract. Uh, and if you don't allow them to do that, if, if this little bar here isn't allowed to get longer or shorter, you know, I put pins on both ends, then I'm going to induce new stresses because it's trying to get shorter, but I'm holding it at one length. And so it's going to be pulling on itself. Um, or if I'm holding it with pinned at both ends and it's trying to get longer, then uh, it's also going to induce stresses in the part itself. And so we're not ready to analyze those just yet in this course. So for now, we're going to set up things as supported by a pin and a roller. Same thing would happen if I put a force, another really big force, Let's make it not quite so big. You know, if I push down on this, if I push hard enough, it's going to want to bow downwards um, and that would make the ends want to shrink closer together. And so if I don't let them do that, then I've got new stresses occurring in the part. So that's why a lot of times we're going to set things up with pinned at one end so it can't move X or Y and then rolling at the other end so it has one direction it can kind of move and another direction it can't move in. Um, but this, if I drew the free body diagram of this, Let's do that. So the free body diagram of my little bar here would look kind of like this. There's a bar. I've got a force on it. And then the pin, I'm going to replace. The pin has two reactions. It's, it's holding the bar from moving up and down. So there's some reaction that keeps it from moving up and down. Maybe we'll call that A, Y, A just being the, the pins at point A and the rollers at point B. Those are made up. Um, the pin is also keeping the bar from moving in the X direction, so I might call that AX. And then the roller is rolling on what I've drawn as kind of a horizontal surface, so it'll let it move horizontally, but it won't let it move up and down. And again, we're kind of ignoring the fact that maybe you could pick the roller up off of the ground, um, and we're going to show that uh, there's a reaction in one direction. We'll call that just BY. So this is non-concurrent, right? Because if I draw the lines of action, they don't intersect at one point. There's point A where two of them intersect, and then AY, BY, and whatever this force is, they're all parallel. So they never intersect in our regular 2D plane. So um, also, let's assume that I know, uh, let's make this force equal to 50 pounds just to have a number in there. If I had 50 pounds here, I've got three unknowns, AX, AY, and BY. With these three equations, I might could have solved that, but the third equation here is in the Z direction. I'm not even showing forces in the Z direction. I really only have X and Y, so I really only have two equations from what I used previously and three unknowns. So I need something else to keep uh, to be able to solve for these three unknowns. So what we need is we need a new equation. Oh, we can get rid of this guy, move him down. We need a, a new equation. We need an equation that uh, tells us if this body is rotating about some point.
and we want to say that it's not rotating about some point. And the some point is kind of generic. It could be any point. We don't want it rotating about any point in our local coordinate system. We're not talking about it's rotating around the sun or the center of the earth or something like that. Um, we're talking about in our local coordinate system here, it's not rotating about any of those points. Um, and we call this tendency to cause of a force to cause rotation. So we call the tendency of a force to cause rotation about some point a moment. So that's our moment. A moment is the tendency of a force to create rotation about some point. Um, and so what we want is we want to take all these moments and we need to make sure that they add to zero. So we need to make sure that all moments are, yeah, that all moments uh, sum to zero. For our free body, oops, not four, four our free body diagram. So whatever we drew, this little bar with some forces on it, that's our free body diagram. We can make it more official with a coordinate system. X, Y, some dimensions, uh, five. Wow, that's another one of the ones that's set too large. And maybe two. So now it's a free body diagram with dimensions and variables and forces and all that kind of stuff. We need to make sure that the summation of any moments we could come up with on this for on this diagram, they need to add to zero about any point because we don't want this rotating about any point in our local coordinate system. So we need basically this equation. We need to say that the summation of M, so that's moment, about some point that we'll pick equals zero. Um, so X and Y, we define them as positive when we draw the coordinate system. X going to the right is positive. Y going to the upwards direction is positive. Um, and we may or may not have actually defined moments to be positive. Depends on how strict you are. Uh, you can kind of take and if you put your hand and fingers in the X direction and curl them towards the Y direction, then your thumb will be pointing in, in A direction. That's kind of the positive direction for the moment. Um, so it also depends on where the Z axis is, which we didn't even show. So what we need to do to make sure that there's clarity on where positive and negative is, is on our little equation when we write some of moments, we need to just say that, um, counterclockwise is positive. Or maybe you want to do clockwise moments or positive. It doesn't actually matter um, when we're writing this equation. We just need to make sure that the equation is internally consistent. So pick one. Or if there's one defined, like in web work, maybe it defines counterclockwise moments or positive or whatever, then go with that. But if you're just working it out on your own, then pick one of these and go with that. A lot of times you're going to have the one counterclockwise is positive. A lot of, if it's given, a lot of times that's going to be what's given or what's the standard for whatever you might be doing. But as long as you keep track of it in your equation, then you're okay. Um, so let's, oh, let's also make, we, we defined a moment as like the tendency of a force to cause rotation about some point. That's a rotation. Um, moment is also equals force times distance. Um, and since we're using X, Y coordinates, we're going to specify that where F 
is perpendicular to D. Um, you could also do a cross product if you were doing vectors, and that would be the same thing, or it would have the same effect. Um, let's let's copy our beam here, or our free body diagram of our beam. Copy. And paste him down there. Again, let's keep sliding that down. All right. So using this, we know that the little beam, you know, if we, the little yellow beam here, we know that it is not rotating, or it's not supposed to be rotating. That's, I guess we didn't say that, but we know that it's not supposed to be rotating about any point. Um, so I can go to my free body diagram and I can pick, you know, any point I want to, that point or this point or this point or this one or this one, any point on the diagram that I can imagine, the beam should not be rotating about that point. So I can pick a point and there are better and worse points to pick. You know, I can pick some of these kind of random ones that aren't even on the beam and that would be fine. It would still be a true equation but there's generally better ones to pick. So most of the time, maybe 80% of the time, when you're wanting to write a summation of moments equation for a free body diagram, find the pin. You know, remember we have these things supported by a pin and a roller somewhere usually. Find the pin and do the summation moments about that point. So we call that point A, so write summation of moments about point A equals zero, and then let's pick counterclockwise moments to be positive. So what this equation says is that the beam, the yellow beam, is not rotating about point A. And if it's not rotating about point A, it's not rotating about any other point in our coordinate system either. So um, now we need to actually write this equation keeping in mind that a moment is equal to a force times a distance and force and distance need to be perpendicular to one another. So we're going to go to point A and every force on here, F, B, Y, A, Y, and A, X, has the potential to create a moment about point A or to make the beam rotate about point A. So a good reason to pick this pin is because both AX and AY, they're pointing right at point A, the blue dot. Um, so they would not try to rotate the beam about point A by pointing at point A. That's kind of like trying to open a door by pushing on the hinges. It's not going to make the door swing one way or the other because you're pushing at the point where you're trying to rotate. So. Um, that's a reason why it's typically good because typically you don't know the reactions at the pin. So AX and AY are both variables and they won't show up in this equation because, or they, they could, I guess I could write it. Uh, AX would be the force and its moment arm, the distance from it to the pin is zero. You know, its line of action actually goes through point A. And then AY, I could add it in. AY would be the force. Its line of action would go through the pin, so it would have no moment arm. So this distance is sometimes called the moment arm. So F, though, the well, let's do BY. BY, its line of action is over here. It's a vertical line of action. So perpendicular to vertical, remember the force and distance have to be perpendicular. So if the force is vertical, then the distance has to be horizontal. So I'm looking for the horizontal distance between BY and point A, which I labeled as five plus two, seven. Seven, uh, I didn't put units, let's assume they're feet. Feet. Um, I need a sign though, is BY times seven feet, is that a positive moment or a negative moment? At the beginning of my equation, I said that counterclockwise moments are gonna be positive. That's when I drew the little counterclockwise arrow and put a plus sign, that's what it's telling me. In fact, I might 
write that out. So counter clockwise moments are considered positive. So that's what this little part is telling me. And I could have done the opposite. I said, could have said the clockwise moments are considered positive. Um, so then I go to BY, since that's the one I'm looking at. BY, if I imagine this yellow bar being pushed on at by force BY, so it's kind of pushing on the bottom of it upwards, then the yellow bar, if it was pinned at A, which I'm kind of, it's not that it's physically pinned there, but I my equation is talking about rotation at point A because that's what I said. So I mentioned a moment about point A. So I am imagining point A to be the center of this rotation that I'm describing here with all these, with this equation. So if I imagine it to be the center of rotation, I push on the bar with BY, then the bar would go around counterclockwise around point A. So counterclockwise, I said, is going to be positive. So this would get a plus sign. And then the only other force on my diagram is F, the 50 pounds. So it has 50 pounds. Again, it has a line of action that's vertical. So that means it needs a horizontal distance between F and point A, which I labeled as five feet. And if I imagine, again, the yellow bar is rotating about point A, or it's allowed to rotate about point A, and I push down where F is, then it's going to go around clockwise. The bar is going to, you know, rotate clockwise around point A. So that I have to give a negative sign. So all of these, AX times zero, AY times zero, BY times seven, and negative 50 times five, those need to add to zero or else there is some kind of moment causing the bar to rotate about point A. And I said there wasn't motion or rotation about point A. So these need to add to zero. The only unknown really in there is BY because the AX term and the AY term are both zeroed out by multiplying by zero. So my equation is really BY times seven feet uh, minus 50 pounds times five feet need to add to zero. So therefore, I can break out my calculator and do 50 times five and divide by seven. 35.7 pounds. This number came out positive. So since this number came out positive, it means that I originally drew the orientation of BY the correct direction. If I had solved the equation and turned out that uh, it was negative 35.7 pounds, that would just mean that when I drew the arrow for BY and wrote the equation based on that arrow, that I really should have drawn it the other way. I should have, it should have been going the other direction. And sometimes that will happen because you don't always know which way the arrows might be pointing and you had to pick something to draw it. And all of the worst thing that will happen is you solve the thing and it turns out it should have been going the other way. All right, so that's fine, but what if we had something different? So what if the 50 pound force is at an angle? So let's go back to our, move him down some more. Go back to our little bar. There's a y, a x, b y. But now let's put. Oops, didn't want to do that. Put this guy fifty pounds, and let's make it. Well, let's see what angle is that. 
45, well, I don't want to do 45. Let's make it something other than 45. Let's make it uh, 30. There we go. Go up there. 30 degrees. And that says 50 pounds. It's kind of... Okay. So here, I have two options. One of them I can figure out, you know, BY is still going to work the exact same way that it worked before. Or, remember the force needs to be perpendicular to the point. So if I want to, if I want to go in and use point A as the center of my rotation equation anyway, the moment equation, then I could figure out where is this line of action for the force and then where's the 90 degrees from that you know is it, it's right uh, 60 could be right there so i could go and figure out that distance oh yeah won't well, let me do that because that's 90 degrees so i could figure out that distance and that force to create the moment 50 pounds times whatever that distance is generally that's not the easiest way to do it um, because you got to do some figuring on what is that distance d some people may prefer that method and it's totally legitimate it works fine what we're going to do most of the time in class as far as when we have a force that's at an angle is we're going to break the force into its x and y components so we would normally do this problem this way so oops You know, the X component would be 50 pounds times the cosine of 30 degrees. And the Y component, 50 pounds times the sine of 30 degrees. And we wouldn't worry with trying to figure out this stuff down here, which you totally could do. But typically, that's not what we're going to do in class. All right. So let's put our same dimensions. This was five, this was two, and everything else is fine. All right, so we're gonna write, again, the summation of moments about point A still needs to add to zero because we still don't want the bar rotating about any point and we don't want it rotating about point A. We'll still have AX times zero and AY times zero. I'm not gonna write them down this time. Let's keep the idea that counterclockwise moments are positive and let's still have by times seven feet uh, and that's a positive because it's going counterclockwise and then let's deal with the x and y components of the 50 pounds so that the x component is just like ax now technically if i got really zoomed in you know i drew there might be a tiny, tiny little moment arm right there. We're going to ignore that. So pre I'm pretty sure that every t instance of this type of thing in this course, we're going to ignore the fact that there might be a tiny moment arm. Now, if you have some information about this thickness, then okay, uh, take half of it and calculate the little moment that gets created by that but in general we're going to say that that moment arm is so small it doesn't really affect our equation and 50 pound cosine of 30 the horizontal component doesn't create a moment about 0.8 or if it does it's so tiny we're going to ignore it but the other one the y component 50 pounds times sine of 30 degrees has a vertical line of action and it is five feet in the horizontal direction and it goes around clockwise you know it would it would, if i push down on this it would go around clockwise so that gives it a negative sign and those two things the y component of the 50 pound force and by basically need to counteract each other so that the beam is not rotating about 0.8 
So I can solve this equation, the only unknown is by. And it just says that, oops, hold on. 50 times sine of 30 times five foot moment arm divided by seven, 17.86 pounds. So it decreased, you know, it was 35.7 pounds, but that was when the 50 pounds was pushing straight down. Now that we've got it at an angle, uh, there's less reaction on BY than there was before because a lot of the 50 pounds is being reacted by the pin at A actually, so AX. Oh, let's point that out. Up here, if I did summation of forces in the X direction, AX is the only force shown in the X direction. So AX equals zero there. But here, I do have two, four, I have AX and I have the 50 pound cosine of 30. So they uh, are equal to each other, basically opposite directions. Uh, so AX is not zero here, but BY went down. So uh, changing the angle does affect other things other than just the moment about A. Uh, let's see. We did that. All right, we need these moments, we need to be able to calculate these, calculate these moments because um, the things we're going to start doing now are non-concurrent force systems. And now suddenly to these three X, Y, and Z equations, now I have the third equation for uh, static equilibrium. These three are still true. X needs to add to zero, Y needs to add to zero, and Z needs to add to zero. But also the summation of moments about any point on my free body diagram needs to add to zero. So I get, I get a fourth equation, which really is usually I get a third equation because most of this isn't going to be done in three dimensions. Um, so now I have another equation I can work with and we'll use that. We're going to use it first in the idea of presses. So we're going to start into this idea of what is a truss. So a simple little one sentence definition that I have here is that a truss is some kind of structure. Uh, and it's composed of two force members. We talked about those a little bit early on. We'll talk about them again. So composed of two force members um, and it behaves. So the structure composed of two force members that behaves as a unit. So you've attached all these little two force members together and they behave as one cohesive unit. Um, remember a two force member just in case don't remember. So two force member is some kind of element that has two uh, axially aligned, um, we'll just specify even more collinear forces that act in opposite directions. So maybe you had, here's the element and you had a force here and a force here. Or maybe you had the element and you had a force here and a force here. All of these are the same, you know, same magnitude, but opposite direction. So the top one's showing a tensile two force member, the bottom one's showing a compressive two force member. Um, and one thing we didn't talk about, it doesn't happen all the time, but you could even have the member curved. So maybe the member's like this. In this case, um, you know, where do the forces act? If it's a two force member, it's still the axis is defined 
by where the pins are, where the connecting parts are. So the forces would still act like this, or they could be in tension, it doesn't matter. But um, so if you have some oddball shaped piece, then wherever the pins are, there's two pins, one on either end of this member. Or, well, they don't have to be at the very end, but there's two on the member, there's only two. Um, wherever they are, if you connect the dots between those two pins, that defines the line of action for these collinear forces. And then whether or not their tension and compression determines which direction they point. We won't very often have curved pieces, but they can be two force members too. All right. So now we need a couple of assumptions for our trusses. And these assumptions are basically set up so that um, everything, every piece of the truss is a two force member. If we violate any of these assumptions, then we can still analyze the thing, but it's not a truss anymore. It becomes a frame or a machine or something like that, which we'll do later on. But um, first assumption that we need to follow when we're dealing with trusses is that each member, so the member is like, you know, one of these pieces. I think I called it an element at one point, but each member is connected by two, and only two, frictionless pins. And not always, but usually the pins are at the end uh, or at each end of the member. Normally, there's no reason for them to be anywhere other than the ends, um, but technically you could have something where they're not at the ends and it still behave like a truss assuming there's no force outside of these pins, but that kind of goes into rule number two, is that uh, external forces are only applied at pins or joints. Sometimes we'll use joints, actually probably most of the time we'll use joints as the pin, same thing, just where the members are connected together. Um, and third kind of goes along with that, and it's either that the weight of each member is either just ignored so it's really small compared to everything else going on, or uh, halved and applied to each pin of the member. So for instance, if I had a member here, it's got a pin at this end and a pin at the other end, if that thing weighs enough, uh, most of the time, actually almost all the time in the course, we're just going to ignore how much the thing weighs because the forces are large compared to the weight of the member. But if I need to think about how much this weighs and I, I can't put it here, you know, I can't do that because I, I can't do, I can't put forces on the beam. I have to put forces on the pins. So instead of putting it there, I take half of it and put it over here and put the other half over here. So if I need to account for the weight of the member, that's what I do. Most of the time we're not gonna account for the weight though. So if all of these three are true, then, so if true, all members in the truss 
are two force members. And if it's not true, if any are not true, um, the structure is a frame or a machine if it has moving parts. And most importantly with that, you cannot analyze it like a truss. All right. So here's a real truss. Yeah. So I've got this thing, you know, it's some little, I don't know, bridge truss somewhere. Uh, it looks like a railroad track goes across it. And it clearly does not look like it has pins holding it together. Like, I don't see a big bolt right here or a big bolt right here. So how, how can it be a truss if it doesn't have, you know, like the very first thing I wrote down? H member is connected by frictionless pins. So we're going to analyze these trusses as if they were connected by frictionless pins, but in reality, they're probably connected by uh, this type of thing. You can kind of see it there where there's a gusset plate and it has the similar effect to a pin. Here's another, you can kind of see this gusset plate right here. And there's a big one over here. So what's going on here is if it was a frictionless pin, I can get it the right size. If it was a frictionless pin, then it would look like this. So let's pick, let's pick that top corner where you've got a piece coming in here. And again, we're going to actually put a pin here. It had a piece going straight down and it had one coming over here and one coming over here. So what I'm trying to do when I say that it's a frictionless pin is, and these aren't all in tension, I'm just going to draw all of these in tension, is that I create a concurrent force system because the other sets of the uh, assumptions mean that every member is a two force member. And so then I can draw these forces going in the direction that the members going in because they're all straight members. And it looks like everything would intersect at this point. So what I'm trying to do is create a concurrent force system. And if we look close at this thing, that's more or less what they've got going on here. You know, if I, if I look at the force here, and the force here, and the force here, and the force here, they do all intersect, well, right in that same spot. So there's kind of this virtual pin effect going on there. What I don't want to happen is something where maybe I build it like this. So maybe here's the top piece. And I put a piece over here, and then I uh, put this piece going down. Maybe there's a piece over here. And then I bolt it all together with the gusset plate. Then my line of actions, you know, I've got this, I've got this here, here. Maybe I do that one in compression. But I've got multiple, you know, here's a point where they all intersect. Here's a point, and here's a point. And... I don't have a concurrent force system anymore. I've got moments trying to twist things around and everything. So 
Um, this bridge, and most all trusses that you're going, if it's a truss, what you want to see is that every one of these joints is lined up to where, even though there's not an actual pin, you know, maybe this one's a little bit low because it's got something going across the top. Um, you know, there's kind of this idea of a concurrent force system at every one of these gusset plates. And that's what I want to have happen. And a lot of times you'll have um, trusses that aren't, you know, technically they're, they're violating some of the rules here or whatever, but we're going to analyze them as if every one of these rules is followed. So if I take, let's take a simple version of that truss, not the whole thing, but let's take a little mini version of it and let's look at how we might analyze the thing. All right, so a simple version. Let's say that we've got a top. I'm just going to use these little circles. Those are the joints or the pins that we're imagining are there. And let's put here, here. So something like that. And we'll label, normally when we're labeling the trusses, we're going to start in the bottom left corner with the letter A and just go around alphabetically. That way we can talk about uh, member CD and know which one we're talking about or member DE or whatever. And it's clear which one we're talking about. Uh, let's put some units. Let's say that this is four. So we made it much smaller. That's four feet. That'll be four feet also. That looks like that's three feet compared to the others. And let's put some force on here. Here's a new force that we haven't used. Let's put 20 and then kips. This is kind of like the same thing as the KSI that we had before, where uh, they took the K from the metric system, the kilo K, the thousand, and they put it with pounds, and so 20 kips whoops, is 20,000 pounds. And so you'll see these type of units in trusses a lot because they're typically, typically going to be dealing with very large forces. Instead of writing 20,000 pounds or 50,000 pounds, you write 20 kips or 50 kips or something. All right. Um, let's let's say that there was a pin at A and a roller at B. So if there's a roller at B, there's going to be some reaction BY. I'll assume that the roller was rolling on a horizontal surface. There's no real pin. Actually, over here, you can kind of see there is kind of a pin on this side, you know, where it's uh, attached to that embankment type thing. You can't really see that there's a pin or roller or whatever's on here. It's probably a lot like the other end, but somewhere in here, there's an allowance for things to shift um, like a roller. So like on a bridge, when you drive across a bridge and you hear the periodic thumping sound, you're driving across expansion joints. So there are little gaps in the uh, bridge that are filled with some flexible material so that when it does stretch or contract, then uh, there's somewhere for it to go versus it being locked in everywhere. So we're going to treat our trusses as having some kind of way to do that. And we're going to say that there's a roller somewhere. And then A, I said there's a pin. So I'll show it with an AY reaction and an AX reaction. So these are the reactions that are keeping the bridge from moving left and right and up and down. And then the roller keeps it from falling down on the other side. Um, and I put 20,000 pounds in the middle of it. So what I do to deal with this thing is typically I get something like this to start with. Usually the first thing you want to do is draw a free body diagram. So we did that. Here's X. There's Y. So normally you start out with drawing a free body diagram. Um, and then, well, let's write down that. Draw 
free body diagram of entire truss. This is not 100% what you would do every time. Sometimes you can see shorter, you can shortcut some of these steps, but if you don't see what to do next, then just follow these steps and you might do a little bit extra work, but you will um, still be able to solve the problem. So we, we did that. We drew the free body diagram of the entire truss. This is it. <coughs> next, you would solve for external reactions. So that means, uh, in this case, AX, AY, and BY. And you would do that by doing summation of moments, summation of forces in X, and summation of forces in the Y direction. All of those have to add to zero. So um, let's do that. Again, this is one where it, it norm, it's going to follow the normal rule of um, do the summation of moments about the pin first. So we'll do that. The pin was at A's. Well, this time let's say that clockwise is positive just to have a different thing. These need to add to zero. Otherwise, if they don't add to zero, that means this entire truss is rotating about point A one way or the other. And we don't want it to do that, so they need all these moments need to add to zero. <clears throat> and even though we've got all this stuff drawn here, I've, only, I've basically got the exact same problem I just did with a beam, where I've got 20,000 pounds going one way, clockwise around point A, and BY going counterclockwise. So um, this time I said that clockwise is positive, so if I do the 20 kips times the four feet moment arm that it has, that would be clockwise, which is positive, minus BY. It has a vertical line of action, so I need the horizontal distance because they have force and distance need to be perpendicular when I'm calculating moments. And it has eight feet from that line of action to point A. And that's it. AX and AY um, do not create moments about point A, so they're not going to go in this equation. So therefore, BY equals a positive uh, 10 kips, or 10,000 pounds. And then you could do summation of forces in the X direction equals zero, and that just says equals AX. So therefore, AX equals zero. And in my free body diagram, there's only one force pointing in the x direction. There's only one force that has an x component. Um, so it has to be zero or else the truss is moving in the x direction. So that's easy. And then I use the last equation. Summation of forces in the y direction have to add to zero or else the truss is moving up and down. Um, and that says that Ay minus 20 kips plus by equals zero. And I just found a value for by is 10 kips, so I could say that uh, ay minus 20 kips plus 10 kips for by equals zero. Therefore, ay equals 10 kips. All right, so now, and you might want to go and label those on your diagram. If you want to, that's zero, AY is 10 kips. But now you've, uh, you may not have needed to do this. Depending on exactly what the problem was asking you to do, you may not need to do these steps. So if you get into the problem and you see that, well, I don't really even need to know what BY is to solve what the problem's asking for, then don't solve for it. But if you don't know what to do, then just solve for everything, all right? So the next thing I need to do is, for now, we're going to learn two broad methods for dealing with trusses. The one that we're going to do today is called method of joints. So we're going to write our third step is method of joints.
And in the method of joints, what you do is you look for a member that has, or a joint, you look for a joint, it's method of joints. So look for a joint. with only two members. So that means A and E qualify. B, C, D, and F all have more than two. So A has A, B, and A, F, and E has D, E, and E, F. So in our case, joint A, R, E. Oh, I, you know what? <laughs> That's weird. So I put BY equals 10 kips, but I put that on joint E. It would probably make a lot more sense that that is EY. You don't have to change it. Just recognize that. All right. Look for a joint with only two members. Um, look for a joint... that has at least one known force. So, of A, I know zero is AX and AY is 10 kips, so I know one thing at joint A. And at E, again, there's the EY, BY little problem, but um, I do know there's 10 kips pointing up at E. Um, so either one of these would still work. All right, so I pick one of those and draw the free body diagram of that joint. And it's going to be a 2D because um, we're only going to do two-dimensional trusses, uh, planar trusses. We're not going to deal with what's going on in the three-dimensional part of these trusses. Um, so it's going to end up being a 2D concurrent force system. So let's just say that we did, uh, we chose A. So you go back up here to A and you isolate it and you draw its free body diagram. So A is just a pin, and then I had an external 10,000 pounds, so 10 kips, and I had a force here and a force here. These I don't know, and I don't know, unless I'm good at looking at the truss and figuring out what parts are in tension and what parts are in compression, I don't know, you know which way to draw these two arrows. So I'm going to just elect to always draw them in tension until I know better. So I'm gonna put that one in tension and that one in tension. Remember tension uh, makes the arrow point away from the body. The body in this case is just the little pin at A. And I will label them the force in, this would be AB because that's member AB on that angle. And the other one will be the force in member AF. And I knew something about this having a rise of three and a run of four that was given by the dimensions. It's got a, uh, a height of three and a, well, actually, no, it has a run of uh, two. It doesn't have a run of four. So a run of two. Um, so I could either use that two and three to calculate the angle between a b and a f or what i'll do this time is calculate you know what's this little hypotenuse right here so three squared plus two squared add that together take the square root of it and you get 3.6 let's go with 3.6 i'll use that all right once you get a 2d concurrent force system it goes back to what you did on the first day or maybe the second day, or whenever it was, um, you apply your summation of forces in the x direction to this system and to the y direction. Um, in this case, it actually makes sense to do y first. 
um, because only AB has a Y component, AB in the 10,000. Um, if I do that, then I'll be able to solve for AB. If I write the summation of forces in X first, I'll have two unknowns, the X component of AB and the X component of AF in that equation. So sometimes it makes sense to write X first, sometimes Y first. Sometimes you have to solve them simultaneously. But this is why we wanted to uh, look for a joint with only two members. If I drew a different free body diagram of one of the joints that has three members, then I have three unknowns. Um, and so I, I might specify, I look for a joint with only two unknown. Because at some point I'll know AB and then joint B has BC and BF unknown, but I know AB. So there's only two unknowns at a time, which plays into the idea that it's a 2D concurrent force system. And I have two equations, summation of forces in X add to zero, summation of forces in Y equals zero. So here, this equation would say F AB, I drew it going upwards. So that gives it a positive because I'm, so here's the tricky part. You kind of have to flip between tension being positive, compression being negative, uh, and then also at the same time think about X and Y. So they're not X and Y is not related to tension and compression. So when I'm writing these equations, this is talking about summation of forces in the Y direction. So it doesn't matter if it's tension or compression. It matters is it pointing in the positive Y direction or not. So make sure that you don't get your signs confused by you have to put a negative sign on a tensile force because we're talking about two different things. So here, AB, I drew it as a tensile force and it points in the positive Y direction. So it gets a plus sign. And then uh, I would do the um, three, oh, oh, three over 3.6 to get the Y component of it, based on my little uh, rise run and hypotenuse triangle there in blue. Um, or you can figure out the angle and do sine or cosine. AF has no Y component, and then I also have plus 10 kips from the four set that was labeled AY at one time. These two need to add to zero or else joint A is moving in the Y direction. I don't want joint A to move in the Y direction, so these need to add to zero. So when I solve for this, FAB equals 10, or negative 10, uh, divided by 3, divided by 3.6, 12. But it's negative kips. So this negative sign means that... Uh, F A B should be in compression because I calculated everything based on my free body diagram and I turned out that A B should be a negative number. So that means the error I drew for A B was the opposite of what it should be. It should actually be pointing towards point A. Um, at this point, you have to decide are you going to go back and correct all the arrows or carry the negative sign through? I'm going to carry the negative sign through versus redrawing the free body diagram, but whatever makes more sense for you is what you should do. All right, now I can write X and it has, I want to write it based on the free body diagram and then plug in the things I know. So AB and it's positive based on my free body diagram times 2 over 3.6 plus AF and the 10 kip does not have an X component. These need to add to zero. Now I'm going to plug in AB is actually negative 12 kips times 2 over 3.6 to just get the X component of it equals negative FAF. So I'm going to move that to the other side and the two negatives cancel out. So AF will actually end up being a positive number, which means I did draw it in the right direction. And it's just 12 times two divided by 3.6, 6.67 kips. And since it came out positive, 
then I actually drew AF in the correct direction. At that point, you have two new things and you kind of go back through looking for a joint with two unknown members. So now um, F is still uh, has four unknowns and two known things. And that's the 20 kips known and the value of AF is known, but it's still not a good one because there's four things unknown and you only have the two equations every time you make a new joint free body diagram. So you would either need to go to B, which now you know AB, and solve for BC and BF, or you still have E over there where you have DE and EF unknown, and you know the 10,000 kips at what I labeled as BY. Let's do B just to make sure we know what's going on here. Because it does have an interesting choice. Let's keep both of them on there. All right, so B. Uh, let's put it here and give it X and Y. And I don't know what's going on with BC or BF. So I'm just going to draw them. There's the force in BC and there's the force in BF. And I'm just drawing them as tensile forces because I don't know any better. Uh, I do know that BF has the same... Uh, rise of three, run of two, hypotenuse of 3.6. I know it has that. Um, and then I do know something about AB. And so here's where you can either keep with your strategy of drawing everything in tension and keep that negative sign, or maybe now's the time to go in and say that, well, I know that AB is in compression, so I'm going to draw it as a compressive force and put the 12 kips on it without the negative sign. So either keep the negative sign and keep everything in tension arrow wise or draw the arrows that you know in the correct orientation, but then drop the negative sign. So don't do both. Don't draw it in compression and put the negative sign on it. So that's maybe a, the tricky part about doing this is deciding how you're going to handle when you get a member that's in compression. Yep. Yes. If it's compressive, um, each one of these free body diagrams, you know, basically right now I'm drawing this free body diagram. So if it's compressive there, it's going to point towards joint B. If it's, and, and maybe this would be a good thing to do. So here's A, here's B, here's the little piece in between them. So if this thing's in compression, then everywhere it has to be pointing towards the member. No matter which piece of the member I draw, it has to point towards it. If I draw the joint, then it has to point towards the joint. If I draw the actual member for some reason, then it needs to point towards the member. If I draw joint A, it needs to point towards that. And if I look at it, each one of these would have the same magnitude. And so I get equal and opposite reactions. This is Newton's third law. Uh, I get equal and opposite reactions at every one of these places. Same magnitude of force, but I'm looking at it from a different point of view, from the pin or from the member or whatever, but they all are consistently compressive um, because they're all pointing towards the member or the joint or whatever it is I'm looking at. So, yes, long way to answer your question. Um, I am going to say it's probably less confusing, I think, to when you draw a new diagram, draw the arrows the way that you know they should be. I could totally be convinced that it's easier to always draw them in tension and keep up with the negative signs also. So they both work. It's just don't do both of them at the same time. Pick one way and do it that way. So either draw this or draw this. You still don't know BC or BF, so they still have to do what, well, they don't have to be drawn in tension, but you don't, it, unless you're good at looking at the truss and knowing which way uh, things are compression and tension wise, then you don't know. So draw one of those. So the difference, the only difference is that I have drawn the compressive arrow with a positive, meaning that I know that that arrow is the right direction, 
on the top one. The bottom one, I drew all my forces, all my member forces in tension, but I know that that one's actually compression, so I put the negative sign on it. So whichever makes the most sense to you, draw that. You'll get the same answer as long as you're consistent. And then the end, the answers we want to know are, is F, which uh, this is what we actually want to know, F, A, B is 12 kips and then of compression. And F, A, F is 6.67 kips and it's in tension. So at the end of the day, you write your answers like this so that it's not confusing because some people might keep the positive signs on everything. Some people might do negative, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you write your number in a C for compression and T for tension, then there's no confusion uh, on what you were intended for those to be. Um, because some people might keep the negative signs. Some people might flip all the arrows around. Who knows? So at the end of the day, write it with um, a C for compression or a T for tension so that it's not confusing. Um, let's see what we're at. Okay, let's solve this top one. I'll do the top one. And again, now that I know the 12 kips, I can uh, use summation of forces. In this case, again, Y is the better one to do because I have two unknowns in the X direction and only one unknown in the Y direction. So summation of forces in Y, I have, um, I guess I could draw this on here. It has the same rise of three, run of two, 3.6. All right, so 12 times 3 over 3.6 is the y component, and it does point upwards, so it's positive, um, minus f, b, f, and only times 3 over 3.6. Those two have to add to 0. So what this says is that they're the same value, except that f, b, f, is going to turn out to be positive. Kips. So that means that FBF, the positive sign here means I drew the arrow in the correct direction. I drew it as a tensile arrow, so FBF is in tension and it has 12 kips. And then summation of forces in the x direction need to add to zero. So I have 12 kips times 2 over 3.6 plus uh, I'm going to put FBF as a variable. So I'm going back to the free body diagram um, and then I'll plug the number in for it. 2 over 3.6 plus FBC based on my diagram. Those all have to add to zero. And then I put in the 12 kips for FBC. So that ends up being, I have 12, well, let's just write it, 12 times 2 over 3.6 plus another 12 times 2 over 3.6 um, equals negative FBC. So that total FBC is equal to a negative 12 times 2 divided by 3.6 times 2, 2.2 kips. And the negative sign means that I drew FBC the wrong direction. It should actually be pointing to the uh, left, which would make it point towards the uh, joint, which is compression. Oh wait, not 2.2. 12 times 2 divided by 3.6 times 2, 13.3. There we go. So we would actually write that as FBC equals 13.3 kips, and then we'd specify that it's in compression. And we didn't do that on here, FBC, but, uh, or FBF, that one would be in tension. And then you could keep going, and where's the, where's the way up here now? Um, now, actually, let's do time is it? Yes, let's do C because it's an interesting one and then we'll stop there. All right. 
So joint C, here's the joint. Um, FBC, which is connected to it, is in compression. So I'm gonna draw it in compression, 13.3 kips. Um, this one is CF, FCF. This one is FCD. And that's what, so you can see it, that's what there is. Two horizontal ones and a vertical one. And when I go and write, well, let's do summation of forces in X equals zero. It says that 13.3 kit, well, X is this way, Y is this way. 13.3 kips from the uh, BC plus FCD has to add to zero. Therefore, FCD is also a negative 13.3 kips or a compressive. Let's write it that way. So that's its actual answer. But when I write summation of forces in Y, I get FCF, a negative FCF, and that's the only one, equals zero. So this is a weird result. Whoops, didn't want to scratch it out. I wanted to highlight it. This is called a zero force member. And this is a thing that happens in trusses. So in this truss, depending on how it's loaded, several of these members could be zero force members in, in that they, when you calculate them, they don't actually have any force associated with them. Um, but you have to remember that you calculated this in one instance where there's 20,000 pounds loaded at joint F and there's 10,000 reaction pounds at A and Y and there's no forces anywhere else. So in that one instance under that loading, then yes, CF is a zero force member, but you might move the loads around somewhere and it's not a zero force member. Um, but they are nice to identify because if you can look at the truss and see zero force members, then that's one thing you don't have to solve. So here's some rules for finding zero force members just by observation. All right, so step one, look for a joint with three members. Step two, um, does that joint have two collinear members? So in ours, joint C has three members, B, C, C, D, and C, F, and two of them are collinear. B, C, and C, D are in the same direction. They don't have to be horizontal or anything like that. They just need to be in the same direction, whatever orientation they might be. Step three, um, let's see. So look for a joint with three members. We did that. Does that joint have two collinear members? Yes. Does that joint, I'm going to have to word it weirdly to make it do what I want. Does that joint have no external force applied to it? If so, yes. The third member is a zero force member. All right, so if we answered this one no, then not a zero force member. Well, actually, I guess I should put that here. No. not a zero force member. So in our case, way up here, 
we had joint C has three members. B, C, and C, D are collinear. There's no force, no external force applied here. You know, no external forces on joint C. Not internal forces, not like member forces, but external forces like the 20 kips or the 10 kips. So as long as those are not there at C, there is one down there at F, but it's not applied at F. It's not applied at C. Uh, then the third member, the one that's not collinear, is a zero force member. So you can actually take them out. I normally don't take them out. I just kind of, you know, make them like this or draw a zero on them or something. That's not a zero force member. Um, so they remind me that, hey, that's a zero force member. Part of exam one will be a truss with a bunch of forces on it and identify all the zero force members in the thing just by looking at it. You won't have time to go through and calculate everything. You got to be able to look at it and see if there's a zero force member. Um, and if you if you find one like CF, then you can it does two things for you. One thing it says that um, if you were to calculate CF like we did, you would get a number of zero kips or pounds or newtons or whatever. Also, it would tell you that the two collinear members have the same force. So the CD and the BC both have 13.3 pounds of compression. Um, there is one other way to find a zero force member. Um, two members. Well, let's, let's write it this way. A joint with only two members, only two members, and no external force That gives you both members are zero force. So that would, that's not going to happen often, but uh, maybe if you had something like this, here's your truss. And you have a force over here and a force here, force here, maybe a force here. And that's the way it turns out looking. Here's A, B, C, D, E, and F, then C, D, and E, F are both zero force members. Um, just because they're kind of just hanging out there. Again, we're neglecting the weight of the members themselves. So assuming that it's okay to neglect the weight of the members, then uh, those two would be zero force members. Normally doesn't happen that way, but it is possible. Once you find a zero force member, you should go back to step one and see if, you know, taking that member out, does anything else qualify? In this case, it doesn't. But sometimes um, there would be another uh, joint that only had three members then at that point. If you took member CF out, it's a zero force member. Maybe there's stuff that it was connected to that now only has three that qualifies. And you can have a chain reaction. One other little detail about trusses is that all these closed loops in the trusses, all the little shapes are always triangles. So this, you might actually see this kind of truss um, in a house or a barn or something, but it's not really a truss that we're gonna analyze because this open part right here is not a triangle. So not, a truss, at least not the kind that we'll analyze. Um, because once you add a fourth member, it's not inherently stable anymore. A triangle, you know, a triangle, assuming the members don't change length, a triangle can only ever be this shape or whatever shape it is. But a square or any shape with more than three sides and connected by frictionless pins, this thing could, without changing the length of the members, could become like a rhombus, right? So it's not inherently stable. Um, so the we'll, we'll talk about an equation next time that will tell us 
based on the number of members and number of joints, if this thing is statically determinant or not. Um, and we also need to make sure that all the little pieces are triangles, not squares or octagons or hexagons or anything like that. All right. I think that gives us enough about moments and trusses. We're not done with trusses, but we're done, I think, for today with trusses. And uh, we'll come back Monday and talk about a different method to solve trusses. We'll probably work some more truss method of joint problems too. There's some web work to do, so keep working on it. I had a question about the homework. Okay. Thank you.